I would like to see some more, you know, domestic producers doing in-house work and just taking, you know, doing a really good job and, and offering us some really cool stuff. Like, you know, if the Kershaws and CRKTs of the world would say, hey, let's make five awesome knives this year instead of 25 mediocre yes. ones. I would love to see that. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your hosts, Jim Person and Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Hello, Knife Junkies. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, episode number 32. I'm Jim Person. And I'm Bob DeMarco from thenifejunkie.com. Welcome to the show. Welcome to another episode weekly of the Knife Junkie Podcast. We talk knives each and every week right here. We're on your favorite podcast player, your podcast app, or just right on the website, theknifejunkie.com, where you can listen. And uh, from time to time, we have YouTube knife reviewers on. And, uh, Bob, that's what we've got here on this show. Yeah, uh, we spoke with uh, Kevin Cleary, one of my favorite YouTubers. He and I have uh, similar tastes in knives, and uh, we look for similar things in knives, so I always gravitated towards him. He's also uh, just a super nice guy, and uh, that also comes through in his videos. So, yeah, um, yeah he's an interesting guy to talk to. Yeah, very uh, soft-spoken, very thoughtful, very uh, intelligent-sounding about the knives. So uh, I'll be honest, I haven't, I haven't seen any of his videos, but the way he came across on the interview, just uh, re- really thoughtful about it. And extremely opinionated, which is one of the things I like about it. Oh. I mentioned to him, he reminds me of one of my favorite all-time curmudgeons, Andy Rooney, just mm-hmm. a little bit from the old 60 Minutes uh, shows. Uh, he, he really digs into the things that... Uh, are substandard in knives that shouldn't be anymore. Hmm. So uh, we get into that a little bit, too. Okay, okay. Sounds good. That interview is coming up, but I do want to remind you that if you are going to be uh, shopping and buying a knife uh, online, especially, uh, and you want to save some money, get some cash back, then uh, you'll want to start using Ebates. And because you're a loyal Knife Junkie listener, if you're not already a member, you'll get $10 for joining if you go to thenifejunkie.com slash cashback. It's easy. Uh, I even use the uh, Chrome extension for Ebates. So whenever I go to eBay or an online merchant, Ebates will automatically pop up and ask if I want to use their link and save money. And I'm like, well, duh, yeah. So shop like you normally would and get cash back. Go to thenifejunkie.com slash cash back and sign up. After you spend 25 bucks, you'll get $10 back. Thenifejunkie.com slash cash back. Bob, what do you say we get into that interview? Let's do it. Subscribe to the Knife Junkie's YouTube channel at thenifejunkie.com slash YouTube. I just wanted to uh, start by saying uh, a recent video of yours really resonated with me. I love your your sort of rant videos. and. <laughs> I hesitate to say rant because rant implies some anger. I sense joy in your rants. Sure. And your most recent one, Turning from Knife Sin, just it had me uh it had me nodding my head the whole time and laughing good, good. and chuckling at your uh, how how triggered you can get over these <laughs> uh, knife pet peeves. And I think uh I think we all um we all experience that. And you reminded me a little bit of Andy Rooney. Do you remember him? A little bit. Probably a little before my okay, time. He was, yeah, you seem to be a young man. When I was growing up, uh, we watched 60 Minutes when I was a yep. kid. That was the only thing we could watch on Sunday. And they had their, their resident curmudgeon was Andy Rooney. And he'd come on and he'd say, so how come this and that? So tell me, how did you develop such um, intense opinions about knives? Well, uh, I guess part of it is just, you know, using them, reviewing them. I, I uh, did a quick look at my channel in preparation for this. And I think there's like 600 and some odd videos there. So I've handled a lot of knives and, you know, sometimes you feel like, you know, some of these things are known issues. And so my, that, that whole video came from the idea that, you know, if we all know this is a thing, then why do we keep doing it? And in a way, why do we accept it as consumers? You know, shouldn't, shouldn't these companies know by now to center their blades, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and some of the things, feel like they shouldn't be that difficult. Now I'm not a I'm not a manufacturer, I'm not a mechanical engineer, nothing like that. But you kind of feel like, you know, if if a $30 rat one can get it right, then I don't know, there's not much excuse for a $300 whatever you want to fill in the blank with. Yes. 
So how did you get into knives in the first place? Uh, has this always been a thing for you or did it just come with the uh, advent to YouTube? Well, it's kind of always been a thing. I, you know, I had one of those dads who felt like uh, a man should have a pocket knife on him at all times. And mm -hmm. uh, so certainly he did. And ever since the time I was a little kid, you know, I've, I've carried a knife, usually some kind of old slip joint. And so that's probably the earliest influence. In fact, he, you know, my dad, before I knew there was a whole world of knives, uh, my dad had a, a custom fixed blade that he used that a friend had made for him. No one you'd ever have heard of or anything. Just, you know, he worked in a machine shop. And so there were some machinists there and uh, one of them made knives. And uh, so I, I always, in the back of my mind, or, you know, it's always been a thing for me to have a knife and have a good quality knife. And mm -hmm. so, you know, that was just something growing up. And then it, the, the real rabbit hole moment came when I was carrying a Gerber paraframe and the, mm. and the thumb stud fell out of it. And I was like, this sucks. I got to get a better knife. And, you know. Imagine my shot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so I started, I started watching YouTube videos. And back then it was like nothing fancy, cutlery lover. And the apostle, Rob, was just a little bit around back then. Uh, probably Jim Skeleton was starting around then as well. Anyway, so it just kind of led to this whole you know, rabbit hole of, you know, and after watching all these videos, I think I bought a rap model one and then it just kind of mushroomed from there. So, uh, you're from Canada. Did you grow up uh, hunting and fishing and stuff like that? Is that, uh, or, or is my, my view of the Canadian lifestyle totally, <laughs> totally. I mean, yeah, there's, it's a real, you know, there was a lot of hunting and fishing, you know, when I grew up, uh, certainly my dad was that way, you know, most Saturday mornings, we'd be up early in the morning fishing, uh, in the winter it would be hunting, but you know, there's obviously there's a big urban population like anywhere else too, that maybe isn't as mm -hmm. into that. So is, uh, it difficult to acquire the kind of knives you, by the way, our tastes are, are very similar. I like uh, I like folding knives that are three and a half to four inches uh, in blade length. And uh, we, we kind of have similar tastes. Is it difficult for you to get your hands on some of these things up in Canada? It's actually not that bad. Um, I do. I order a lot of stuff from the States. Now, there, there are some Canadian guys who are like, nope, I'm not ordering anything. I'm not taking the risk of something coming across the border. The The risk is actually not quite as bad as maybe some have made it out to be. Uh, I don't know how many knives I've brought across the board. It would be hundreds. And I have had one confiscated. It was, uh, I, I don't even know if I should say the name. I'll leave the name out. It was a custom knife. The first time I was ever going to have a custom knife, I got it in a trade and it was stopped at the border uh -huh. and had to be sent back. But it's rare. that That's happened to me, you know, one out of probably 500 times. What about automatics? Are they uh, permissible up there? Oh, no, no. Automatics are, are a no-no. And in, it's not... I know a lot of the states and even European countries, there are a lot of stuff you can own as long as you don't carry it around with you. But an automatic is considered a prohibited weapon here. So it's a charge just to be in possession of one. Uh, and so I don't even toy with it uh, because I, I own firearms and a prohibited weapons charge would mean all my firearms go away. It would mean like criminal record, a whole big issue. So of the knives you've been looking at recently, uh, just looking at your channel, what what are your favorites right now? I know you love the Spyderco Amalgam, but uh, what are the exciting newest knives? Um, yeah, the Amalgam is fantastic. I couldn't believe how good it is. Um, I'm still pretty stoked. Uh, every At least one day a week, I still carry the 8010, uh, even though I've had it for a little while. Oh, yeah. uh, I'm really impressed with the Mastra Orc. That, that knife, oh, yeah. uh, the Orca, I should say. Uh, that knife is really well done, and it's it's a little smaller than I would like it to be, but it's great for, you know, if I'm going somewhere where maybe I'm, I'm afraid a larger knife will stand out too much or something like that. Uh, so that's, that's I'm not, you know, I it works well for those situations. Uh, the 0460 or the 0640, let's get that right. There's, oh, yes, 0640 yes, I love mine. is really nice. I think I'm the only person in the world who actually likes that <laughs> green carbon fiber. <laughs> you probably are. It's like split pea soup. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I'm not in love with the carbon fiber, but uh, I, I'm hoping uh, to have a, a different scale for it sort of soon. Yeah. So uh, the Oaks knife, yeah. the, the mass drop, I think that's very interesting because of that, uh, the whole sort of, um, 
what do you want to call it? The 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 fake bolster. A faux bolster. Faux, faux, faux. I guess. Yeah. Yes. Um, and it, it looks like it's uh, sort of made with a bunch of stippling and then sort of separated with a little valley there. I, the the look of that is very appealing. It also looks like it might really be nice in hand. It's really nice in hand. And uh, that, you know, I, it's a little thicker. So if you're one of those guys who, I don't know, wear skinny jeans or something where you're skin, you're skin tight, uh, it may not work for you. But uh, that, that would be about my only, the only potential issue with it is a little, it's a little fat. So uh, your video, I mentioned it before, uh, turning away from or turning from knife sin. Uh, you have mentioned before in your videos that you're a minister. Yeah. So how, if at all, does uh, your knife hobby intersect with your ministerial work? Um, it doesn't a lot. Uh, certainly, there are you know there have been some some opportunities for maybe conversations with people where you know we can find common ground on knives and then you know, move into other areas that, that are maybe more serious that they want to talk about. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, you know, so it's been a little bit of a help that way. Uh, probably the opposite, you know, because of, because I'm a minister and because I, you know, I have to speak publicly on a regular basis that probably helped me and, and helps me a little bit with presenting on YouTube. So. Right. Right. So what are you carrying today? What's in your pocket today? So in my pocket today, I've got the uh, Paisan. All right. So, you brought it up. Tell me about it. <laughs> you like it? I mean, it's so it's the second, I, I think if I'm correct, it's the second integral from Spider Co. And it is also the second Peter Azenti yeah. model. Yeah, it is. In, in your estimation, I guess I could watch the video, but uh, I know that's just a first impressions that's out. How, how are you feeling about it so far? Um, I love the design and I love the finishes. There's a lot that I really like. It's incredible for, you know, it weighs like 4.2 ounces for a knife wow. with you know a full three and a half inches of blade it's it carries like a dream but there are a couple of misses the blade is the biggest one i don't know why they ground it so thick uh, but you know i've had outdoor survival knives that had a thinner grind behind the edge than the paisan does and it seems so out of character for spider co to do that that i just can't wrap my head around it yeah, especially when you look at it, it 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 almost has a straight razory feel, or 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 a uh, it just looks like it's a thin, super thin, sharp kind of razory knife. I'm I'm surprised to hear that it's that it's thick behind the edge. Yeah, it's really, and I don't know what to do about it actually. <laughs> uh, whether I you know whether I should just sell it and move on with life, or whether you know I should find someone to to put a hollow grind on it. Man, you're going to be in deep. You do that. That's going to be a lot more money into a knife that's already expensive. That's that's the one thing. I, I've been uh, on a little kick getting micarta scales for various knives just because I'm a sucker for micarta mm -hmm. and I'm sick of black G10. But once once you pay that that micarta bill, your monthly micarta bill, you're like, wow, I'm, I'm spending a lot more money on these knives than I, I, maybe I should just be buying different knives. Yeah, and I definitely, you know, my rule of thumb would be if someone said to me, you know, I don't like this knife, but I think it could be great if da 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 da, da right? Whatever, whatever thing they want to change. Normally, I'm going to be like, "Don't do it," right? You're yeah. you're never going to get that money back out of it. Uh, and if it doesn't work right. out the way you want it to, now what are you going to do? Right, you're not going to get your money back, and you're going to have a knife that you hate like doubly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It would be a reminder, a shameful reminder. So you were talking about thickness behind the edge. Explain what that means. I at the outset of all the knife reviews uh, in 2008 when that first started and I started paying attention, no one was talking about thickness behind the edge. Now you hear that all the time. And even some manufacturers list it in their catalog uh, information. Tell us what the, the importance of thickness or thinness behind the edge is and why it's desirable to have one or the other. Yep. So, uh, you know, if you, I, I guess it can be desirable to have one or the other. You're right about that. Generally speaking, in an EDC knife, I like to see something a little thinner. And that's because when you first go to, you know, push that blade into some kind of material, think of trying to push a butter knife through, you know, your your stick of butter versus going out to the garage and getting an axe, right? Now you've got this huge hunk of metal and you're trying to push it through. Uh, and if that butter is cold because you keep it in the fridge, 
you can imagine which one's going to work better, right? The butter knife, because it's so slim, it's just going to slide through. And so, right. and so you want that thin edge right behind the, the secondary bevel so that you're not trying to push a huge amount of material through whatever substrate you're cutting. So it's a, it's a mere matter of being able to cut and slice and do it. So why would you want a knife that's thick behind the edge? I have a couple of hinderers that are prized and I have them super sharp, but no matter how super sharp I get them, uh, you know, until I spend that 150 bucks and have razor's edge, uh, mm-hmm. thin them out a little bit. They're, they're kind of like wedges, but they're still beloved, but yeah. They're, and they, and you know, they're, they're a knife that's just meant to really take a beating. And so. Because, you know, so you, then you want that extra stability and you want that extra strength so that there's less chance of breaking. It depends a little on how you use your knives. I know a lot of people in the knife community would say, you know, I will never put any kind of lateral force on that blade. So, you know, they can go as thin as they want. It's not going to be a problem. But if you're the kind of person who might, you know, jam that blade in between something and try to wiggle it apart or something, then that matters. Yeah. Yeah, I, I often wonder about that because um, I have, uh, so I started uh, getting into knives in the 80s, the late 80s um, with Cold Steel. They came out with their Cold Steel Tanto fixed blade and it was a thing of legend among me and uh, myself and my young, you know, tween and teenage friends. Yep. Um, so always in the back of my mind, also, you know, raised on um, on Arnold Schwarzenegger and, and uh Rambo yeah, movies. Right. So that's it so was always in the back of my mind that that you're gonna need, you are going to need at some point to rely on your knife for you know life or death. And you're gonna be hang, hanging over the side of that cliff. You're gonna have to wedge it between two rocks, pull yourself up. Can your knife do that? If it can't, it's garbage. <laughs> so we've <laughs> so um <laughs> that being said, I'm trying to um I think that's where my love of large pocket knives also comes from. And I'm I'm trying to to I feel like I'm missing a lot. There are a lot of beautiful designs in the three to three and a quarter inch range that I'm missing out on because that four inch or three and a half inch uh, mark hasn't been met. What, what's, why do you have that uh, size preference? You know what? I'm sure that's part of it as well. Like there's some part of me that takes some kind of weird pleasure from knowing that, you know, my cold steel, uh, that, that, that stupid lock will hold a completely inordinate amount of weight that there's no business you should ever have on your knife. Okay. (laughs) So I definitely get that. Um, and I, I totally agree with you. And and I keep going back to the trough, trying to find that small knife that I'm finally going to say, Hey, this one satisfies me, but it never does. And so, and there are some nice smaller knives out there and, and I've tried a lot of them and I've reviewed a lot of them, but every time I do, it just reaffirms my previous conviction that, yeah, it's gotta be three and a half inches or more. Yeah. I made, I made the idiotic mistake of buying a knife that I knew uh, I I wouldn't carry the Wii rectifier. It's this, uh, I think you may have reviewed it, but it's a little three inch, it's a beautiful little knife. And and something about the design always uh, resonated with me. And, and I was buying one for my brother-in-law for Christmas. And I was like, geez, I could just as easily click two. <laughs> yeah. And then but for myself, because I've been so good. And that's what I did. And, uh, I was just carrying it today and just fidgeting with it. And I'm like, really, this is, this is a, this is literally a, a $145 fidget toy. Oh, and I, I cut my general so's chicken with it. You know, I, I, I I have to, I have to stop doing that because, uh, I don't need a collection of three inch knives. I'm not going to carry. Yeah. I kind of feel the same way. And there are some that are so good. You know, the Benchmade emissary is kind of right on that borderline, but what a fantastic knife. And I just couldn't keep it. It was just, I just felt inadequate when I carried it. I'm sure you, you know, this, uh, better than than most as a as a youtube reviewer but it's an odd thing in the knife world there's there's a lot there are a lot of polarizing issues um could be makers that people like or dislike or designs that some find superior to others whatever it is in your experience as a youtuber and a pretty popular knife youtuber what what kind of uh controversy have you stumbled upon or um what what words do you wish you you never uttered <laughs> Um, 
you know what? I, I have been pretty insulated. I feel like, um, uh, you know, my, my comment sections tend to be really tame and, mm-hmm. you know, I, I, I talk to other reviewers and, you know, they share these stories about just insane stuff where I'm like, you know, how could someone ever get that animated about a knife? Um, or even, you know, and, and sometimes they'll even get like racist comments or stuff. And I'm like, in a night video, yeah. I don't get it. So I'll, you know, I'm really, really fortunate that I have not had a, a whole lot of drama. Uh, there have been a couple times where, you know, I said something and, and someone got mad at me. Um, and I, and I have, if I'm wrong, I'm happy to, you know, make a follow-up video and say, Hey guys, I blew it. I thought this worked this way, but it really was that way. Or, you know, I thought they had, you know, made this choice, but it turns out if you take the whole knife apart, you can find, you know, uh, a good example is I thought, uh, that a knife had steel screwed into aluminum and I didn't really like that idea. And I made the comment and the, the manufacturer emailed me and said, if you take the knife apart, you'll find there are steel inserts in there. And sure enough, there were, so I kind of had to eat my words. Uh, but yeah, I'm happy to do that. Was that a company that uh, freely allows you to disassemble their knives or? <laughs> yeah. Uh, now I don't know what their policy is. Man, I, I, I just think it's so weird. Um, you know, um, Microtech, I only have one and I would like to get the uh, LUDT. I, I think mm-hmm. that's such a beautiful knife. And, and a couple of their out the front too. Uh, but the one I have is the uh, Elite, the uh, SOCOM. SOCOM yeah. Elite. Thank you. And I got to say, the hardware on it does look cool, but man, it sticks in my craw that they're just like, nope, not you. You're not, you know, you're not smart enough to take apart this knife. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it, it does a little bum me out a little yeah, bit. Yeah, that's really frustrating. Now, I always think about, I wonder if I worked at Spyderco, if I would feel the same way. Because I wonder how many knives they get back where they're like, what an idiot. <laughs> you know, if this yeah. if this guy would not have taken yeah. his knife apart, it would be fine. Uh, so I'm sure there is that as a legitimate problem for a manufacturer. You know, once you say, go ahead and take it apart, then, you you know, they probably say, look, we're, we're asking for trouble, increased cost, the whole thing. And in Microtech's uh, defense, they... I, I know from the outset they were primarily automatic knives, and I would imagine most people taking automatic knives apart, especially out the front, are, are a disaster on the reassembly. Yeah, I, for sure, you know. So I could see them wanting to maybe wanting to nip that in the bud and and just kind of lock it down with something you can't unscrew. But uh, uh, speaking of that, uh, we knives, you know, they had yeah, that for a, yeah, a with while. the star. Yes, with the star, which actually kind of looks pretty corny too, I gotta say. Yeah, it does. But they've uh, uh that's a matter of that's a matter of personal taste, but they've they've sort of drifted away from that. What do you think of We Knives and Best Tech and Riot and these outstanding Chinese manufacturers that are allowing the designs of these outstanding designers who we could never afford, uh bringing that to market? Yeah. You know what? I think that's fantastic. Sometimes they come up with some really nice in-house designs, but that's I think that's where those those companies especially struggle. Uh, you know, they end up making, you know, 25 designs in a year and kind of throw them all out there and hope something sticks. Uh, when they when they collaborate with a really good, well-established designer that you know can do good work, I, it's almost always a win. Right? I I know of very few cases where uh, that kind of situation hasn't worked out really well, except for Boker, who tends to struggle with quality control. But for mm-hmm. yep. for like we and Best Tech and even some of the the new guys coming out, there's one that stands out to me. They just like they came out in the first year with probably 30 designs, and I just can't think of their name. It gives you option paralysis. It's like it just just give me three really cool yeah yeah uh, things to choose from, and I'll buy one. But when I see twenty, it's like yeah. Did you put your heart into any of these, or which one do you think is the best? You yeah, know? exactly. You can tell what a company thinks is a is a flagship, and and what a company is doing to sell knives. Yeah, yeah. This knife collecting hobby. I'm not sure if you would consider it a hobby, but how do you see it evolving in your personal life as you you know? As you age. Well, I, and I'm sure I'm not the only one who does this. 
I go back and forth a little bit. You know, there are days when I think to myself, you know, I should sell everything and own like five really nice high end, you know, like I should own mm -hmm. a Koenig Arius, uh, a 3.5 inch Shamwari, um, a Hinderer, a couple Savenzas, and call it a day. Yes. You know, and then the next day though, I'm like, I don't know if I'd, I don't know if I'd want to use and carry those knives as much. And, you know, then something like the Spyderco Amalgam comes along and I'm like, this is such an amazing knife and it's not $500. And so, yeah. you know, <laughs> it, I go back and forth on that. And I'm sure many people do. Yeah. It, it's like, it's like saying, I'm only going to cook with basil, oregano, salt, pepper, and Parmesan. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, I guess, that, you know, for the rest of my life. You know, eventually you're gonna you're gonna want to change it up. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and that that variety being the spice of life thing. You know, and and for a while I was, uh, so I'm pretty bad at selling off knives. I I I'm very good at acquiring new ones and then and then making plans. Okay, <laughs> so now now that I have this, I it rounds out this side of my collection. Now I can do that big sale, and uh, I, I have a harder time getting around to that. But uh, one of my justifications was, well, when the bottom falls out, I'll be able to sell these. Or, uh, you know, when the apocalypse comes, this will be great trading material, all these knives, you know? You know, I, I bet I could get a ham sandwich for this for this <laughs> uh, wee knife here. But uh, those are all just justifications, you know, for this weird propensity. Yeah. You know? And, you know, the, I always, I often think to myself, I wonder what my collection would look like if... Um, if I, if I didn't have a YouTube channel. Oh, well, how does that work? Are all of the knives you, um, excuse me, are all the knives you review yours? Do you buy them and then sell them or how does that work? About, yeah, 80, 80% at least are knives that I have bought and then have to resell to recoup those funds to buy something else. So, you know, mm -hmm. part of it, you just don't, so that, that keeps some movement, right? Because, even a knife that I kind of like and would like to keep, you know, I sort of have to go, do I really want to keep it and not have whatever the new thing is that would have that, <laughs> that all the viewers want to see. So I, I really do kind of struggle with that. Uh, every once in a while, I'm fortunate enough to have a company who will reach out and say, you know, Hey, we've got this coming out. Would you like one uh, in Canada? That's mm -hmm. a little tougher. Uh, I do get a fair number of offers and then the person goes, Oh wait, you want us to ship it to Canada? Uh, uh, I don't think we can do it. Can you meet me uh, at the New York? Board? Yeah, exactly. So I get some of that. <laughs> um, I, luckily, you know, I had, there are a couple of retailers who will let me buy at a discounted price to promote them as a retailer. And so that makes it a little easier on the pocketbook and it makes it a little easier to not lose money all the time. So that's, right. that's nice. But yeah, there's, there's a good number of knives that I buy, review, and then sell down the road. So here, here's a big fear of mine, um, which is, um, and, I, and I feel this already, um, but the idea of knives going out of style, like fashion yep. or like electronics. I, I look at knives that I was coveting five years ago, and, and I, I still have many of them. And they're nice, but I never can you know, rarely carry them. And why? Well, because, you know, I just don't carry that. You know, I don't carry two sides of G10 anymore. I mean, you know, <laughs> I, so it's it's gone out like fashion. So do you have any concerns about that? Um, you know what? It's I I do. I don't I don't worry myself overly about it because uh, you can call me superficial. Go ahead. It's fine. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's you know, I just feel like. You know, I'm kind of having fun with it and I enjoy it. I, now, I do try to encourage, you know, friends and family and stuff like that to carry a knife. Um, I'm a volunteer firefighter. And so those guys, actually, those guys get a lot of, you know, a lot of the stuff that comes in for free. I also give it away for free, sometimes through the channel, but often through personal uh, contacts. You know, sometimes I feel like someone who watches all my videos, it's nice to reward them. But someone who doesn't, right? They don't have any good knives where the person who's watching all my videos probably already has 15 good knives and they probably don't need another one. 
so I, I would like for the Kahabi to keep growing. Um, certainly, I know sometimes as reviewers, we'll talk about the fact that, you know, I wonder if there's like a cap somewhere where, you know, there's, I don't know, 2 million people that are into knives and that's it. And that's, you know, once we split up those 2 million subscribers, we're all done. Yeah, you yeah, know? peak knife. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So, uh, you know, I think about it from time to time. Uh, for me, luckily, I don't make a living off it. I'm sure, you know, Sal Glesser has to stay up at night worrying about it <laughs> because, it, you know, it's a knife and really you only need one. So, yeah. you know, you think that there's a huge portion of the population who is going to buy a Tenacious and that's it for the next 10 years. So the, my question is, well, how am I not just a, um, you know, a materialist uh, when all along I've been convincing myself that, no, no, this is materialism. This is something different. Uh, you know, it's an, uh, it's an aesthetic appreciation and blah, 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 blah. It's like collecting art, blah, blah, blah. But really, is it just materialism that I just, oh, my God, Spider-Co has a new knife which I don't need and will never use, but I must have. What is that? Yeah. I mean, I always, there are a number of, what would you say? There are lots of things in life that we need to keep in check. I know people that, you know, spend an inordinate amount of money going to the movies like twice a week. Right. And, and, you know, so if you're doing something as a hobby and it's fun, right. Then I don't think it's, it's unhealthy to to enjoy something and and have uh, a few uh it, when it becomes uh what what do they say uh you know here's the preacher in me coming out but the apostle paul mm-hmm. said that there are, there are lots of things that are fine for me to do but i will not be mastered by anything meaning i'm not going to mm-hmm. i'm not going to be controlled by you know that desire to buy the next knife you know i'm not going to skip a mortgage payment for it or you know something like that and and as long as you're in control and the object is not in control then i think it's it's you've probably struck a decent balance there ah oh, yes thank you thank you that's the justification i was looking for so. <laughs> there you go <laughs> So where do you see uh, the industry headed when you look at where it's come and, and what uh, what is commonplace now in even inexpensive knives like ceramic bearings and, you know, decent good steel mm-hmm. and great construction fit and finish? Well, where does it go from here? Are, are we just looking at new innovations in locks and that kind of thing? Or where do you think things will head? I, I mean, I'm sure there'll be trends like anything else where, you know, you'll start, you'll, you'll see patterns. Uh, you know, I would say maybe, what would you say, 2016, 2017, uh, there was that sort of push of traditionals, but with modern touches, you know, so you'd get a, you know, a Barlow design, but it would have ceramic bearings and a lock. And, uh, you know, so I think we'll still continue to see trends and that'll be enjoyable. It's hard to imagine, you know, the things that we're able to build these days. And I know a lot of that is building overseas, but, you know, the the quality that you can get for like 30, 40, 50 bucks is incredible. Uh, And I remember, I I don't know, you know, when I started doing this, nothing fancy was, uh, you know, the youtuber to to watch and and it's funny as you watch other youtubers how many phrases and terms they borrow (laughs) from him even today um you know he used to always talk about having a a high value knife collection and by that he meant by lots of cheap knives and (laughs) (laughs) and if you wanted to do that today you know you, you could have just an unending supply of new stuff to add to the collection like every month and have all these fantastic knives and and it, you know the the one thing i don't like about that end of it is you know you can sort of get this race to the bottom where you know i want to buy a knife that has a titanium frame lock with ceramic bearings and m390 steel for the lowest possible price i can get yes and it's like yes. well make sure someone suffered making that knife yeah you know? So, and you know what, who, and who knows what's going to happen with, with all of that stuff, because, you know, Chinese economy is changing and uh, those kinds of things. Yeah. But I think it's a great time to be interested in knives. I, I would like to see that this is not my prediction, but it would be mm-hmm. welcome, at least from my perspective. 
I would like to see some more, you know, domestic producers doing in-house work and just taking, you know, doing a really good job and, and offering us some really cool stuff. Like, you know, if the Kershaws and CRKTs of the world would say, hey, let's make five awesome knives this year instead of 25 mediocre yes. ones. I would love to see that. I don't think we will, uh, especially, you know, as I, you know, I was, you know, with Chinese manufacturing, it's ridiculous what they're able to do and the price points they're able to do it at. So I, you know, I, I know companies exist to make money and that's a pretty lucrative thing to do. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, I think that's just the knife lover in me wishing I could buy knives from other knife lovers. Do you have a grill? Do you have a, a knife that you want more than any other? Um, you know what? I don't know that I do anymore. I would have said, you know, before I, I used to love the bodega and, and I've, oh, and yeah. I've tried to, I've almost had a mid tech a couple of times and it kind of didn't work out. Um, but oh, you have the Riot bodega. I did. Yes. You? And it was, it's a yeah. fantastic knife. And that's part of why I, I almost don't, it, it uh, some part of me, whenever I look at a really expensive knife that I think is fantastic, you know, there's a voice in the back of my head saying, you know, when Custom Knife Factory or Reapp builds that, it'll be awesome and it'll be $400. Mm-hmm. So it kind of wrecks <laughs> all the, yeah. the really fancy stuff for me. Yeah, I, I uh, uh, Riot knives are, are my uh, my favorite of those manufacturers right now. And uh, I, I I almost missed my opportunity or or, or maybe... Maybe by the time I actually want to pull the trigger, I will have missed my opportunity for the uh, Kirby Lambert uh, Crossroads. Oh, Do you have that? a great knife? I did have it. Uh, I oh, ended up yeah. trading it for something else. But it's a fantastic knife. It really is. I, I, I have two Riyads, and they're both amazing. And the design of that, I'm, I'm just imagining you know, the action of these others and the fit and finish of these others that I have and have experienced in that design, because that design to me is just stunning. It is. I don't know, something about it hits all the right notes for yeah, me. Yeah, I would say it was it was the best Riyadh of, I, I don't know, I'm biased, okay, for sure. But since the Torrent, I feel like that was the best Riyadh knife, uh, that, the best thing that they've done. The Torrent, and you have another Riyadh recently that you've been highlighting. Uh, now it escapes The me. Jack? Um, yes, the yeah. Jack. And that's a really nice knife as well. Now it's it's big and heavy. Um, yeah. all, almost, and you know, this is, this feels wrong to say, but it's almost too big and, and too huh. heavy. It's like, you're not going to be wearing that in slacks or, or, uh, that's like a straight up jeans knife. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Uh, we're going to wrap up here in a minute, but I want to, I want to do a little speed round with you. Sure. Uh, I, I do this sometimes with people. I'm just going to ask you a, uh, one or the other question and you just, uh, you just give me your answer. Sure. Okay. Fixed or folder? Fixed. Flipper or thumb stud? Flipper. Washer or bearings? Washer. Tip up or tip down? Oh, tip up. Tanto or Bowie? Bowie. Hollow ground or flat ground? Hollow ground. Full size or small? Full size. Gentleman's knife or tactical knife? Tactical knife. Automatic or bally song? Mm, Auto. Gavco or Tough Knives? Tough Knives. ZT or Wii? Tougher choice there. Uh, Probably ZT. Benchmade or Spyderco? Ooh. Spyderco. All right, only five more. Okay. (laughs) Pulling pulling into the station, Kevin. Uh, Milled titanium or spring clip, that is. Mm, If it's a good milled titanium, then yes. Carbon fiber or micarta? Micarta. Finger choil or no choil? Choil. Form or function? Function. And finally, what would your desert island knife be? Uh, And that doesn't necessarily mean you have to survive on a desert island with it, but it means you have one knife for the rest of your life. Uh, The torrent. Ooh, that came so quickly. That came quicker than many of your other answers. I guess the, uh, the Riot torrent is a knife to look at, people. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that's you know what I've thought about that a long time, and and I don't know, it just checks every single box for me. So what? It, so is that knife thin behind the edge, the torrent? It is just right. 
it's it's thin enough to cut well, but it's thick enough that you have total confidence in it. Well, there you hear it, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> the real torrent <laughs> is the Desert Island Knife of Kevin Cleary. Kevin, thank you so much for coming on the Knife Junkie Podcast. I, I had a great time talking to you. I've been uh, watching and uh, listening. Uh, you are part of my after work uh, uh, ritual. You know, as I'm as I'm getting dinner ready, I put on your videos and and uh, you're a part of my life. So thanks for everything you do, Kevin. Awesome, man. Thanks for watching. Thanks for having me on. It was a lot of fun. I, you know, it's always fun to talk about knives, hence the YouTube channel. But uh, yeah, it was it was great to be on here. Have a question or maybe you just have a comment? Give us a call at 724-466-4487. We'll answer your question on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie podcast. That number again. 724-466-4487. We're back on the Knife Junkie podcast. If you have any thoughts about this interview or some of uh, Kevin Cleary's knife videos or any other thoughts, we'd love to hear from you. Call the listener line, the Knife Junkie 24-7 listener line, 724-466-4487. That number again, 724-466-4487. Please leave us a message, leave us a thought, leave us a comment. We'd love to play it back on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie podcast. Bob, uh, key takeaway, thoughts from the interview? Kind of turn it over to you for a sec. Well, just, again, talking to someone I've admired for a few years online, and uh, watching their videos and trusting, growing to trust their opinions, and then speaking with him, it just really occurred to me how diverse the knife world, the knife community, if you will, uh, is he is a uh, he's a minister. He is a guy who grew up in Canada, maybe doing some hunting and fishing. And uh, but uh, he's a minister. And we've spoken with Marines. We've spoken with martial artists. We've I, I know plenty of artists and business folk who love knives. It just it's an interest that draws a, a wide, wide variety of people. Mm -hmm. Kevin uh, was a joy to talk to. I really love how opinionated he is mm -hmm. about how he can really get worked up over a free spinning <laughs> pivot or a pocket clip that doesn't fit jeans. Right. And he's right. And uh, I love it. There's a there's a voice for my indignation. And his name is Kevin Cleary. Well, you know, the, it's not often that uh, you hear people say, I love him because he's so opinionated. Usually it's <laughs> yeah, the opinionated right. people. You're like, oh, God, I can't stand to be around that guy. Exactly. But that's uh, we need people like like uh, Kevin and uh, like some of the other people we've had on the show out right. there uh, who can get their hands on a majority of these knives. So we don't have to go out and buy every single knife and, <laughs> and, and try them out for ourselves. So not, uh, not that you won't try. Yes, exactly. <laughs> not that I'm totally against the idea. But. Right. Well, speaking about uh, having people out there, uh, Doug Ritter, who's been a two-time guest on the Knife Junkie podcast, he's one of those uh, guys that are out there uh, fighting for our rights to uh, to carry knives. Uh, last time he was on the uh, show, which was uh, episode number 29, you can go to the knifejunkie.com slash 29, the knifejunkie.com slash 29. He talked about uh, legislative updates, but also the ultimate steel giveaway Bob, we are just past the early bird deadline, but uh, still chance for uh, Knife Junkie listeners to get in on that ultimate steel giveaway. It is outrageous. I was on the page just today, and it's like a bottomless, endless scroll of knives you can win. Hmm. Not only uh, uh, manufacturers donating knives to the cause, uh, and not only um, purveyors of knives donating knives to the cause, but we have makers like Andrew Demko just donating directly. So these are knives that you stand a chance to win if you go to the Ultimate Steel 2019 and uh, donate money to help knife rights fight for our knife rights. Right. They do that. And I, I was really actually shocked by the amount, like the just the, the pure volume of prizes they have. It, it almost seems like it should be one per person. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> like what, $160,000 or something like that worth yeah. of prizes? Yeah, that's $160,000 worth of knives. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And I know that there are some expensive ones out there, but I mean, come on, that's a yeah. lot. That's, yeah. So anyway, go go donate and see, you know, uh, you, you might just win some. Well, speaking of uh, winning, uh, you had a chance to uh, have one of your YouTube viewers be a winner recently on the uh, thousand subscriber giveaway. You that's right. That for a that's second? right. Yeah, we just uh, we just did a drawing uh, Wednesday, the 29th. 
uh, for the thousand uh, subscriber giveaway, uh, which was, which is a Benchmade bug out. One of my favorite knives the last couple of years, oddly enough, because I'm not a Benchmade lover. Mm. Uh, and uh, yeah, we have a winner. Well, and uh, another video coming out soon. You'll be uh, doing uh, uh, some kind of drawing or some kind of giveaway with. Uh, oh, yes, 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 yes. The uh, cog ring and the Snaggletooth MF from Rob Penna over at Snaggletooth Tactical. Right. Uh, so we'll be giving away that package. It's uh, uh, it's the pull ring, the karambit ring that you can put on a full size. It uh, fits a full size Cold Steel Recon 1. And then the Snaggletooth MF, which is the pocket deploying uh, hook can fit on pretty much uh, any knife with a remo- removable thumb stud. Mm. So, yeah, that, that's going out as a package. So if you're not uh, subscribed, uh, go to the knifechunky.com slash YT subscribe. That'll take you right to the uh, YouTube channel subscribe page so you can uh, catch all of Bob's videos when they come out. And also uh, for these uh, upcoming uh, giveaway videos, those kind of things, you'll uh, be able to to enter to win. Again, the Knife Junkie podcast, uh, where we talk knives each and every week. And Bob, you are the Knife Junkie, so I think it's only deserving. Give you the final word, final thought on uh, episode number 32 as we wrap it up. All right. Well, I would say this week, go out and scratch that itch and buy something that is off your palate, something that you wouldn't ordinarily buy. Try it out for weeks. You can always resell it and get most of your money back. Hmm. But the reason I say this is the Benchmade bug out. Uh, I saw it, turned my nose up at it for a while, and then I got it just because I had a dividend at REI. I picked it up, and I've been hooked on it ever since. Oh. So try something just a little bit different, something out of your wheelhouse. See how oh, okay. it goes. So you bought two, one to give away and one to keep. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes. It was a great excuse. I'm giving away. I had to buy the oh. other one for myself. Oh, God, you know me too well. <laughs> Bob, the knife junkie DeMarco is the knife junkie, and... Knives are his junk. Yeah. (laughs) His passion is what I was going to (laughs) say. Anyway, I've rambled long enough. Thanks for listening to episode number 32 of the Knife Junkie podcast. For Bob, the Knife Junkie DeMarco, I'm Jim Person. Thanks. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Thank you.